Good morning, Chapel Hill. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you are here this morning. A special word of welcome to our guests. Don't forget the sweet, delicious gift we have for you at the end of the service. So, welcome to those of you online. It's a privilege to gather with you no matter where you are throughout the world. I got an email from a person in the Philippines who worships with us. And so it's amazing how technology can be such a gift to us. So I want to invite you, if you're able, to stand, reach out, find a person you have not yet met, welcome each other to worship, would you please? <laughs> Dr. Chapel Hill. It's great to be with you this morning. It's great to be together in the presence of a God whose grace and love is here for each and every one of us. No matter where we are or where we've been, God's arms are open wide this morning. So let's lift up our voices together and give thanks for all that God has done. Let's sing together. Goodness of God. 
God, we are so thankful for all of your love, for the way that you bring us through the fires of life, God. We know that you are always with us at every moment. So this morning, God, we pray that you would enter into this space with us, that you would enter into our hearts, God, that you would change us from the inside, that we would learn to follow you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing for the hymn. <laughs> Thank you. 
A reading from the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. A reading of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Sounds so good. Well, today is, is Good Shepherd Sunday. Just to let you know, I'm not going to tell any bad jokes. I just did. <laughs> Jeremy, our wonderful tech person, he puts the slides up and he said, you know, I normally don't put the title slide up from when you send me your slides, but if you're going to put a dog in a scarf, I'm putting that on the screen. So there you go. You're welcome for Good Shepherd Sunday. Okay, I'm going to give two scenarios. Here's the first one. You're lying in bed. You have these wonderful, warm feelings of faith. You feel a connection to God. It's been a good week. You've had good times of prayer. You felt really close to God. And in this graced moment, if I said to you, do you feel the reality of God, you would say, absolutely, absolutely. I've had those times. I know many of you have had those times. Here's another scenario, scenario two. You wake up in the middle of the night, overwhelmed by feelings of chaos and emptiness and doubt and fear. You feel this distance from God. Things are happening in your life they're not going well. You've been praying, but you feel, where is God? You try to say, are you here, God? Are you with me now? But you're drawing a blank. If you're like me, you've experienced that as well. Those moments when you think, what, what's happening? Why is the God that I felt so close to, why do I not feel that now? Which leads to a question, if those are two realities that we experience, does this mean that on, uh, does mean on one night your faith is strong, but on another night your faith is weak? A couple of weeks ago I preached on faith and doubt, and I talked about how faith is an extension of knowledge based on knowledge. We have an experience and we begin to, we begin to have faith because of it. We have an experience where we connect with God. God is, shows up. I talked about Thomas who said, I'm not going to believe until I see. And then he saw and then he said, I believe. And he was willing to follow. We tend to think that faith is something we don't believe, but we wish we could believe. We're gritting our teeth to believe. But the reality is that we have experiences of God where we feel connection and closeness. And then there are times when we don't. And we sometimes will be tempted to think, well, what did I do? Did I do something? Is my faith wavering right now? I want to talk about that today. Because on Good Shepherd Sunday, what we're talking about is, can I hear the voice of God? Do I have a God who's near me, who walks with me in the dark valleys, who blesses me, who's connected to everything that I'm doing? I do love this statement in Mark's gospel, when Jesus was about to heal a man's son. He said, would you please heal my son? And Jesus says, do you believe? And the man says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Have you ever felt like that? Those times he said, I do believe, but I'm struggling. Somehow there's a gap, and I don't know what's caused that. Why is it difficult at times to feel connected to God? And other times we feel God is present, God is with me. Okay, I'm going to do a little theology now. I am a teaching pastor here at the church. Some people will say, is theology important, Jim? Do we need it? We need it. We need the theology, as A.W. Tozer said, how you think about God determines everything about your life. So I'm going to do a little theology 101 basic stuff here because it connects to this idea of feeling connected to God. Okay, first of all, just an obvious statement, God is unlike any other person. God is not a person like you and I are persons. God is a person, but God is unlike any other person that we relate to. Jeff and I got to go hear Father Ronald Rollheiser a couple of weeks ago, and he said this, 
in his talk. I couldn't write it down fast enough. He said, God is infinite and infinity cannot be captured. You can't capture God. We can have a person hold them kind of captive, get them cornered and see if we can get a hold of it. You can't do that to God. God is infinite. So God is not a thing in the universe like other things are things. You can't control that. God is the context in which all things exist. You exist because of God. We're here today because of God. God is the ground of all existence. God is being. You and I have existence. God is existence. And that's a beautiful thing about the nature of God. Because you and I are limited in our existence. I can only be here today. I am here. I have existence. But because God is the ground of his existence, God can be everywhere and is. Do you believe that God is here with us today in this sanctuary? Yes? Okay, yes? Overwhelmingly yes. Do you believe that God is up the street at New, New Spring? Yes. Absolutely. Is he across town at Eastminster Presbyterian? Yes. Is he way across town with those Quakers at Northridge? Yes. He is. He is. Is he in India right now? Yes. South Africa? Yes. Someone is struggling right now somewhere across the world. God is there. That's the nature of God, the ground of existence. I love what St. Augustine said, God is closer to me than I am to myself. He wrote that in the fourth century. I may feel distant from God, but God is close to me. God is close to you. God is close to everyone who calls on God's name everywhere and at all times. But back to our question, why is it that Sometimes it's really difficult, and other times it's easy to sense God's presence. Okay, first of all, God is not like any other person. Second, God will be seen and experienced only when we seek God. God is always present to us, but we're not always present to God. I love Jeremiah 29, 13, one of my favorite verses. It's a promise, this verse. When you search for me, you will find me. That's a promise. When you search for me, you will find me. When? If you seek me with all your heart. This is crucial. How do we seek God? In my own experience, if I'm honest, there are times that I seek God for my benefit. I seek God because I want God to do something for me. That promise in Jeremiah 29, 13 is saying, if you seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. Seeking with all your heart means I want you for you. Not what you do, but you. That's a huge distinction to know that in your heart. So those obstacles that we face in communion with God, as a new Christian, I really didn't know much. I... I if you ask me what prayer was, I thought it was just giving your laundry list to God. I got some problems. Hey, God help. Or prayer and connection to God was because of my ambitions. Boy, I hope I get into that school. God help me get into that. Help me get into this program. God help this. Help me get an A. Help me get in whatever. I wanted God to fulfill the things I wanted fulfilled in my life. Those are common. And God's big enough to take those. When we go to him with just our problems, he doesn't go, oh, you. <laughs> he goes, well, that's where you are right now. But if that's why you seek God, you're not seeking God. You're seeking the things God will provide. I was really blessed to have two people in my life, two mentors. As a new Christian, I came to French University. I took a class with a guy named Richard J. Foster. He's the one on the left. He'd written a book called Celebration of Discipline. It became a worldwide phenomenon, teaching people how to connect to God through meditation and prayer and solitude and silence. And I learned how to be with God through him. And then through Richard, I met Dallas Willard. Dallas wrote Spirit of the Disciplines, and he taught the same kind of thing. And I got to spend a lot of time with both of these spiritual giants. 
And people say, wow, how blessed you are that you got to do that. What is the, what is the one thing, the main thing that you learned from them? These were two men who knew how to be with God. Not for what God would do, just to be with God. I watched them do it. I knew that Richard didn't know just things about God. He knew God. I watched Dallas. I watched how he moved, how he brought God into everything that he did. I got to see those models, and that helped me move into a different direction. I learned the practice of the disciplines, disciplines for the spiritual life, things like prayer. I said to Dallas, what, what, what is prayer? He goes, well, James, it's simple. Prayer is talking to God about what we're doing together. That's how familiar he was with God. He just, well, God, we've got this thing to do. Let's do it together. I invite you to be a part of that. Worship, giving glory to God, ascribing worth to God. Why are we here today? We're here to worship God, to give glory to God. Because God deserves that. God is worthy of our praise. And we're here gathered to offer that. That's what we do as believers. Study, deep study of the scriptures and of the classics. I watched these two men do that. Dallas and I, we would teach sometimes for two weeks together in some place. Sometimes we'd have the same living quarters. I would see him late at night studying the scriptures. I'd see him early in the morning studying the scriptures. I'm going, you know the whole Bible. <laughs> You're, what are you doing? He was like, well, I'm just connecting to the Lord, learning new things. Holy leisure, that's one of the most difficult practices. It's simply to do nothing for God's sake. You've got to be careful how you say that. Do nothing, pause, for God's sake. Just be. It's a difficult discipline, but you practice it and you learn, I can just be with God. I don't have to be doing anything. I have to be accomplishing anything because God is not found in doing. God is found in being. And you learn these things as you're learning to be with God. One of the things that Ronald Rollheiser said in that talk that we watched, Jeff, he said so many good things, didn't he? But he said this one. He said, God does not appear at the end of an equation. God appears at the end of a way of life. It's not an equation to be figured out, a philosophical conundrum. There's a way of living that if we engage in it, God is there. That's when God appears. And Father Ron said, someone said to him, all these practices that you do, aren't they just going through the motions? And he said, yes, but the motions are everything. The motions are everything. Today, you may have felt coming to church that you were just going through the motions doing what you do. It says another Sunday, this is what we do. We just go. Hallelujah. God is in the motions. God is in these practices. He meets us in these places. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. When I was in my second year of seminary, I, I experienced incredible dryness. My life with God, even though I'd learned from Richard and Dallas, and I had private practices, lengthy times of prayer. I was studying about God. I wasn't being with God. And so a friend of mine said during spring break, hey, I'm going to go to this Episcopal monastery for a five-day silent retreat. You want to go? Normally, five days of silence, eating carrots with monks <laughs> would not be a draw. But I went, I'm at the end of some sort of rope here. I'm going. So I went. And I was assigned a spiritual director. I was very excited. I wanted my spiritual director, you know, you, when you think of a monk, I wanted a guy with a beard, serious beard, blue eyes, peer into my soul, tell me what's wrong. I got this young guy who was a jogger. He had jogging clothes beneath his cowl. He literally wore Nike Cortezes. I'm wearing them today in honor of Brother Madden. And so I went to him and I said, man, I just feel disconnected from God. He said, well, here's a passage. Meditate on it. I was like, okay. I got a lot of time on my hands, brother. One passage? He goes, yeah. So I meditated on this passage for a day. 
went back the next day for spiritual direction. What happened? I don't know. I think I've figured out what this passage is about. Let me tell you my great exegesis. Do you want to hear it? He goes, no. He said, did you, did you sense God was in the text? Mm, no. Okay, go back again. Same text, same text. Went back again. Same thing. Day three, more carrots, more monks, more silence. Day three, how'd it go? I don't know. It's a birth narrative. It's Mary and the angel. I don't know. Why, Father, why am I doing this? You know, he said, Jim, connecting with God is like falling asleep. He said, have you ever tried to fall asleep? I said, yeah. He said, does it work? I said, no. He said, you create conditions and then you fall asleep. Same thing with God. Create conditions and then God will be there. I said, what are the conditions? He says, you have to surrender. So by the fourth day, I went, I'm stuck here. I opened up the Bible. I looked at that passage. I started reading it. And I said, God, show up, please. I'm here. I got nothing. I'm training for a minute. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm here. And guess what? God showed up. That scripture came alive like I'd never seen it before. And for the next 48 hours, I felt as connected to God as I've ever felt in my life. You create the conditions. You go through the motions. You do the things. But you have to surrender in order to experience that connection with God. Our passages for today, John 10 and Psalm 23 that Trav and Ev read, are so beautiful. In John 10, Jesus is explaining, I am the good shepherd. And he uses that analogy. Sheep know the voice of the shepherd. They know the voice. That voice is distinctive. He uses that analogy. What's the point? We can hear the voice of Jesus. We can learn how to distinguish his voice. And Psalm 23, one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible, is saying simply, you can live a life without lack. Everything that you need, God is there. That's what these passages are telling us. When you look at this image, what do you feel? Hunger, someone said. How do, what, does, what does this image evoke? Compassion. It did, yes, it did for me. It's from the, the movie Oliver. My mom took me to see this movie when I was about his age, and I looked like that. I used to have hair. I looked like this kid. I was about his age when I saw the movie, and I was moved with incredible compassion. And here's Oliver. He's been orphaned. He's in this place, and he's got his bowl, and he gets this meager portion. And he goes back, and, please, sir, can I have some more? And remember what the guy says? More? You dare to ask for more? I think we think of God that way, that if we come to God and we say, can I have, he's going to go, what? That's not our God. We have a God who wants us to have a full portion, more than we can ever experience. Dallas put it this way, we're blessed to live in a world where there's a generous God who wants to provide what is best for us and loves us more than we could ever imagine. What do you want for your life? God wants more. That's the nature of our God, this God who wants to be with us. I know some things about your life because I've known a lot of you for a long time. Some of you know things about my life. And I know some things like you didn't plan to fail. There's been failure in this room. Marriages that failed. Vocations that failed. Enterprises that failed. You didn't plan it. You didn't plan to struggle. You didn't plan to suffer. When you or a loved one went through that thing, you didn't plan for that. You didn't plan to fall or to be in need or to be broken or have those nights where you cry, cry yourself to sleep. You didn't plan for that. To lose things you love, you didn't plan for that. But those things happen. They happen to us. And we walk through them. But is this your portion, like Oliver? Is this 
Are those the things God says, that's what I want for you? That's not your portion. That's not what God has in mind for you. What are we hearing in the 23rd Psalm? We go through rough things, but he restores my soul. I face dire situations, but I will fear no evil. I feel a sense of lack, but he sets a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. He blesses me. My cup overflows. How about that? Oliver's bowl overflowing. That is your portion. Your portion, what God wants for you is increase, abundance, healing, restoration, opportunity, favor. That is your portion. That's what you were designed for. That's God's plan for each of you. As we connect to God, that's his plan. That's his plan. And what is your protection? That's your portion. What's your protection? The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack anything. I like the idea the Lord is my shepherd. You know, David wrote that psalm. David was, we know he was good with a slingshot. And we hear that story about Goliath. We think, oh, wasn't he brave? But Goliath was going, I've been protecting my sheep from mountain lions for years. I hit mountain lions from 100 yards with my slingshot. I got Goliath. That's nothing. God has been with me as a shepherd. I like the image, but you know, I, there's an image I like more. <laughs> I love how we call Jesus the Lamb of God, but I like that we also call him the Lion of Judah. I like this image. It's from the Chronicles of Narnia. Aslan is one of my favorite images of, of the Christ. And I love this one. You got Susan's there. And she's got her bow and arrow. She's got some little weapons Aslan gave her. But I want that cat with me. I have this, this image by my, where I pray. And if ever I am sort of discouraged, I just look at that and go, that guy's with me. That guy is with me in the things that I face. I asked Brianna to sing a song. She's going to sing it during communion today. It's a beautiful song by Eliza King. And I've just, I've had it on repeat for the last few weeks. It's called Christ Abide. Christ abides in the, in the crowded thoughts. You ever have crowded thoughts? So many things going on. In the crowded thoughts, you are an open space. And I hear your voice calling me to come away where the eagles fly. You're raising me high with you to heavenly places, heavenly places. I have the mind of Christ. My portion is his perfect peace. Christ abides with me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Good word, sir. As we come to God in prayer, <clears throat> I invite you in the stillness of this moment to listen for the voice of God, to listen for the promptings of the Spirit. We give thanks and praise, O oh Lord our God, that you are our portion, that you are our protection, that you are the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah, that you are the good and tender shepherd, that you and you alone are everything we need. As we draw near to your throne of grace, we come praying for our brothers and sisters in need. And so today we would pray for Monica at Wesley Hospital, Dan Smart at Wesley Hospital, Nancy and Comfort Care. We pray for Greg Young and family and the death of his father, whose service will be on the 19th 
of this month. We pray for Pam Sharp, Caleb Herndon, Pam Kirk, Rosa Wilson, Bill Phillips, Sherry Wilson, Bill Herndon. Oh God, I invite you to minister. I plead with you to minister to each of these, to all of these, with your healing grace, with your comforting love, with your sustaining strength. And now I invite you in silence to name those for whom you would like to pray today. Name the burden and lift it to the Lord of grace. We pray that you would be with Pastor Jennifer in her sabbatical, that you would minister to her by the power of your spirit. We pray, O oh God, for our world, our nation, our state, our city. We pray for all who lead us. And now, O oh God, we pray that you would use our hands throughout this week for your glory. That every person that we encounter, that we would be your instruments, your channels of peace and grace. We give thanks for all the blessings of this day as we entrust, entrust our lives, our ministry here at Chapel Hill to you and pray that you would have your way. For you are the potter, and we are the clay. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. I want to invite the ushers to wait upon us and receive the morning offering. And if you haven't already done so, would you take the black connection folder, please, and pass it across? We want to know how we can pray with you and for you. And then if there's any other information that you'd like for us to have, please indicate that as well.
So what Dr. J didn't tell you, by the way, those helping to serve communion, you can be walking while I tell this story, but the Christian, Christianity Today article about the jogging monk, seeing the monk in his cassock and his white shoes. So we got to get that article for people because that's a great article that appeared. What year was that? 1991? Wow. So thank you for serving servers. Let's give them a round of applause. We never say thank you to them, and we're very grateful. So that my prayer might be our prayer, we join in this ancient prayer called the Great Thanksgiving. I'll give direction as to how we take communion here in just a moment. But as Dr. J said... We're going through the motion of this sacred meal, and your mind may be a million miles away, but it's okay because you're going through the motion, and God is with us. So pray with me, would you please? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, it is good, it is joyful, it is absolutely a holy privilege to give thanks and praise to you, the one who is the giver of everything that is good. And so we pause to give thanks. And we join our voices with the people of God on earth and in heaven, in all time and in all places, who forever sing your praise as together we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for death, he took bread and he gave you thanks. And he blessed it and he broke it and he shared it and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you as often as you eat this bread do so in memory of me when the supper had ended our Lord Jesus took the empty chalice he filled it and he raised it in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord our God the creator of heaven and earth and then he blessed it as he shared it and he said take and drink each of you this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And now we pray, O oh God, that just as that tumbler is rolling, that your spirit <laughs> would roll upon our lives and that we would feel your presence and know your peace in ways that would remind us that we are always and everywhere yours. And so we now offer the prayer that our Savior has taught us as together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For those of you who are here for the first time, we strongly believe that Christ is the host of his table, and all are welcome at the table of the Lord. So the way we take communion here at Chapel Hill, go ahead and distribute, please, is that we have eight stations at this service, one in front of each of the sections. Those toward the front start and lead out, come out the right side and receive the bread as a gift and dip it into the chalice. If you are in need of a gluten-free station, it'll be available at the back of the sanctuary. If you would prefer the prepackaged communion, it is also available near the station that serves the gluten-free. Come and receive the gifts of God for the people of God.
Beautiful song. So BYF, Best Years Fellowship, is those who are 50 and above or those who would like to be, which means that you're welcome to join them on Wednesday, 10 to 1130, at a free docent-led tour of the permanent displays at the Wichita Art Museum. Now, you can go to the Art Museum for free anytime, but you can't always get a docent-led tour. So. That's this Wednesday, and just show up 
at the entryway of the Wichita Art Museum. And while you're there, go eat lunch. They have a tremendous lunch there. Am I the only one who thinks that? <laughs> Do you not care about lunch? <laughs> I don't know how to follow that, Dr. J. It's, it's like I'm getting this blank look like, why are you talking about lunch? So today at 3.30 is the Be United event at First United Methodist Church, a district event with a mass choir of 100 people, and that's going to be downtown 3 o'clock today, and it's going to be an hour-long service, and the music is promising to be phenomenal. So I, if you don't have anything else to do and you want to be blessed, go at 3 o'clock today at First UMC downtown. Dr. J, we're ready for the benediction. And by the way, Dr. Ben is with the youth, so I'll be praying at the cross today if you're in need. Please stand for the benediction. Go forth, knowing that the Good Shepherd is with you. In the dark valleys, in the mountaintops, God is with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.